Um, first, uh, some information about uh, the content of, of the training. Um, um, I will start with uh, providing some information about interactive notebooks, uh, what they are, why, why they are important. Uh, then I will provide uh, information about the project Jupiter. Uh, I will talk about uh, some history, how it started and uh, where it is now. Uh, then we will move to Jupiter Lab um, and uh, we will start with installation, how to install Jupiter Lab or how to use it without uh, installing uh, it to, to your, your, your computer. Uh, then I will provide information about uh, some key components uh, of, of Jupyter and Jupyter Lab, uh, such as uh, kernels, uh, code consoles, uh, terminals, uh, text editor, uh, and the notebooks themselves. Uh, I will talk about a little bit uh, user interface, uh, the workspaces, the file management, uh, and some also advanced uh, features which are relatively new, like uh, debugging, uh, real-time collaboration, and how to change the user settings. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the extensions. Um, as I mentioned, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, so you can use uh, the chat for, for that purpose. And uh, if I, I don't see it, just please intervene and uh, ask directly. Um, before starting, I want to uh, just give a very short uh, introduction to Center of Expertise in Big Geo Data Science, uh, which is in fact organizing the, uh, the training event. Um, uh, we have also participants outside ITC. Uh, most, I think most people from ITC know the center already. Uh, it was established in March 2020 uh, to enable better use of geospatial uh, cloud computing and big data technologies in education, research and capacity development activities. Uh, our mission is to collect, develop and share operational know-how on how to use these technologies to solve large-scale geospatial problems. And our vision is to, to position UT and ITC as a globally renowned center of excellence uh, in this topic. So you can find more information on uh, our web portal, uh, which is uh, indicated on, on the slide. Um, the interactive notebooks, um, the idea of notebooks is not new, and the idea of interactive notebooks is in fact uh, not new. Uh, Stefan Wolfram, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Wolfram Research, uh, and the chief um, engineer um, of uh, Mathematica, uh, which is a famous uh, uh, scientific uh, software package, uh, terms interactive notebooks as the idea of a notebook is to have an interactive document that freely mixes code, results, graphics, text, and everything else. Uh, so the idea is really bring uh, all the components which makes a research a good research uh, together. And uh, notebooks, not the interactive ones, but the actual uh, physical notebooks uh, are traditionally used in, in science in all, all the disciplines of, of, of science to document research procedures, the data calculations and findings. So this is definitely not new. It was like this uh, 500 years ago and it is still like that, I believe. And probably most of us are still using this kind of notebooks. Uh, they track the methodology uh, to make it easier to reproduce results and calculations uh, with different data sets. The reproducibility, as you know, is, is a very important topic, especially no nowadays, uh, with open science uh, principles, fair, fair data uh, practices. Uh, so notebooks also support this, uh, this practice. Uh, they are very useful uh, in education activities because they combine text and code, and um, students can, can utilize these tools together to learn the topics. Uh, they can be used for interactive presentations uh, because the interactive notebooks, in fact, by changing the code or by changing the data, you can you can run and you can show how the results are changing, how the model is uh, is is behaving according to uh, the change parameters. Um, they are also uh, very useful uh, in business applications, especially for business intelligence, uh, because uh, they they nicely uh, capture data visu visualization and a collection of data from, from different uh, sources. So um, all this uh, made interactive notebooks uh, something very useful, also interesting uh, for, for, for uh, mainly researchers, but also uh, by a large community. Um, there have been some examples in the past. So uh, if, if you are close to my generation, most probably you know uh, most of these this software packages like Mathematica, which I already mentioned but there, there is also Matcat and Maple. Uh, these uh, software packages were in fact interactive notebooks, so which uh, allow uh, users to, to enter the equations, the models, 
by using the mathematical notation and, and entering te text in formatted way and then um, format everything as, 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 as a package which can be shared. Uh, but mainly these packages were uh, commercial uh, closed source um, and um, there were some limitations in using these kind of software packages. Um, with, with the um, increase in uh, use of open source uh, projects and, 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 and tools, uh, in fact, we also saw a lot of um, projects focusing on interactive notebooks. Jupyter is in fact only one of them. Uh, there are also Apache Zeppelin uh, notebooks, uh, Apache Spark notebooks for big data computing. Uh, there are also more specialized software like uh, Sage Mat, uh, Polynote or OrgMod, which all uh, allow users to create interactive notebooks with different capabilities. Uh, Jupyter here is, is partly different because uh, it, it, it managed to have a large uh, user community and it became the de facto standard of interactive computing nowadays. Um, how it started, uh, interactive notebooks, more specifically Jupyter, uh, we should look first the IPython uh, package, which is an abbreviation of interactive Python. Uh, it was first developed by uh, Fernando Perez in 2001. And the idea was in fact uh, to provide an enhanced interactive Python shell. So uh, if you already use Python, you know that it's an interactive language. And in fact, it has an interactive shell uh, which you can use to, to write code, uh, especially for prototyping and testing purposes. Uh, but it was not very much convenient uh, to use, mainly because it was difficult to uh, see information about the, the, the variables and the data that you have. Um, the syntax was not highlighted, so it, it was just plain text, sometimes difficult to read. Uh, it didn't provide any uh, code complete, com completion or history capabilities. So the idea of Fernando was in fact to use existing tools to provide this kind of capabilities. But in addition to that, uh, he provided uh, a, a important capability which made it really different from the others, which is the decoupled two process communication. And uh, what we mean with that, normally, if you use an interactive uh, programming language, you, you enter uh, the code and the code run in the interpreter. So they are, they are single uh, program, uh, reading the input from you, processing uh, the, the, the input and providing the output. In case of IPython, these were separated. So basically there was a kernel uh, which takes the code from the user, process the code and then returns the output. Uh, and because they were separated, it was also possible to, to move kernel out of uh, the machine that you use. So it was possible to move kernel to another machine um, like a powerful uh, server, um, whereas you can use your, your machine uh, to just for, for data entry and the co code entry. Um, in addition to that, uh, the architecture was also uh, suitable for, for parallel computing. In time, uh, they started to add more uh, functionalities like uh, additional interactive shells, a browser web notebook interface, uh, interactive data visualization components, um, but the project became uh, too, too complex and monolithic. So everything was under a single package. It was difficult to manage. So eventually in 2014, uh, they decided to break this uh, monolithic structure and they took the parts which are language agnostic, which means not specific to Python, and they move it, but they moved them under the project Jupyter. So this is how, in fact, the project Jupyter was Founded. Uh, meanwhile, um, Fernando Perez uh, got the advancement of free software award from Free Software Foundation in 2012. Um, this decoupled two process communication, as I mentioned, is the key uh, because it, it allows uh, computing kernels to run somewhere and, and interactive uh, components to connect those kernels to do the computation. Multiple interfaces can connect to the same kernel uh, to ask for some computation, and they can also follow uh, the process and visualize them in different ways. So one interactive client uh, can be a text-based console, for example, which provides only the logs of the computation, 
There is another client uh, could be an interactive interface, which can also display the results like a graph, graphs or figures, even in 3D. Uh, the project Jupiter, as I mentioned, was founded in 2014 uh, as a non-profit open source project, and uh, they in fact indicate themselves as a project that will be always 100% open source and free for all use. So if you read the, about Jupiter project, the first sentence that you get is in fact this one. So there is a lot of emphasis on open source and free software in case of, of Jupiter. Um, and in fact, Jupiter is an ecosystem of different software packages. And in addition to that, also some open standards which support these software packages. Uh, IPython, I already mentioned, is the core package uh, which started this, uh, this, this project. And still, in fact, it is the kernel for Python language. Uh, but there are also other components like the Jupyter server, which provides the main server interface, the Jupyter widgets, which provide uh, interactive components uh, for, for, uh, for computing purposes through uh, notebooks. The Jupyter notebook itself provides uh, the notebook uh, functionality, which combines, in fact, code narrative and outputs uh, under a single document. Uh, there are different consoles which can connect to kernels. We have Jupyter Lab, which is an integrated development environment for, for Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and there is also Jupyter Hub, which allows multi-user Jupyter Lab uh, deployments, um, which can be accessed by a group of people like us, in fact, because the geospatial computing platform that we provide to our staff and students is, in fact, a Jupyter Hub deployment. Uh, and there are many. Uh, so uh, if you look at the project, you will see that uh, it's, it, there are many uh, uh, components uh, of, of, of the Jupyter. Um, as I mentioned, it is not only software. It is also about open standards. The first standard is, is a notebook document format. So uh, it is completely open, com uh, very well uh, documented, which means other software packages can also uh, create and use this kind of notebooks. Uh, there is an interactive computing protocol which allows uh, developers to develop their own kernels. It means um, uh, the independent developers or uh, software companies uh, can easily develop kernels for their uh, own language or um, different languages that are available um, on the market. Uh, and there is also a kernel API uh, for, for, for the developers to further extend this Jupyter ecosystem. Um, Jupyter Lab, uh, which is the main topic of uh, today's um, uh, training, is in fact the ne next generation, the new web-based user interface of Project Jupyter. Uh, and it enables to work with documents. So from documents, we mean in fact the notebooks or files or images. And the activities, and the activities are like uh, co uh, code consoles, uh, terminals, um, and also other tools. Uh, for example, a remote desktop connection, which might be integrated to the system, uh, to be used in a flexible, integrated and extendable way. Um, it can be run locally, so it is possible to install JupyterLab to your own machine, and you can use it without any internet connection, or it can be deployed to a remote server, and you can use it uh, from, from that remote server by using the uh, internet. In both cases, the same software runs uh, on local machine or remote machine. So uh, the, the features that you have, the capabilities are uh, identical, except some limitations which might be uh, put in place uh, by, the, by the server operator. Um, very briefly, I want to talk also about JupyterLab history. I don't want to go to the detail, but I just want to uh, highlight some, uh, some, some numbers. Uh, there are about 400 contributors to the project, and so far, starting from uh, 2015, uh, they had more than 23,000 releases of the software. So it is a very well uh, maintained and developed uh, software package. But still, there are about 2,000 issues which are still open. So that means there are still some problems which needs to be fixed. Um, they they started uh, uh, zero version and right now uh, the the production version is uh, 3.1 uh, and the next version which is under development is four 
Uh, I'm mentioning this because major, major version upgrades are usually quite challenging for the community. Uh, some extensions, for example, uh, are still not compatible with version 3, although we are talking about uh, the new version 4. And that becomes partly a problem because if you are a user of that extension or if you are a user of that, uh, that component, then basically you stuck uh, to, to a previous version. But as you can see from the release dates, the community is still um, providing support uh, for, for the previous versions, uh, which is nice. Um, and moreover, uh, because JupyterLab is the next uh, generation of the interface uh, for, for Jupyter, and the before, previous one uh, was Jupyter Notebook, still there are some, some extensions and components which are not compatible even with JupyterLab. And the most important one, which is partly also important for us, uh, is the MB Grader. Uh, MB Grader is an extension which allows you to create uh, some notebooks um, uh, which can be filled in by students. Um, for example, you can indicate the questions and you can put a, a place where they should uh, write the code or, or provide the output. And MB Grader automatically grades uh, and the, the results. Um, so it's really useful uh, for, for, for many courses, but unfortunately it is still not compatible with JupyterLab. So there are issues like this with, with uh, JupyterLab and Jupyter ecosystem in general. Uh, how you can try it? So uh, first of all, uh, there are options to try JupyterLab without installing it. The first one is even provided by the Jupyter community. So if you go to try Jupyter, so uh, I will share the presentation with you of, of, after the training and all these are linked. So just by clicking, in fact, you can you can go to the, to the website. So uh, uh, the first one is uh, try Jupyter. So if you go to that website, basically you can try uh, Jupyter Lab or different versions of, of uh, Jupyter notebooks with different languages. Uh, without installing uh, this, this, um, these languages. Uh, it, it is running on binder, so you need to wait a little bit uh, for your uh, container to be initialized, but afterwards you can try uh, all these different languages and the interface. Uh, another nice way to try it is Jupyter Lite. This is a very new member uh, of the uh, Jupyter ecosystem, uh, which is mainly uh, a Jupyter lab written in Rust and then compiled with WebAssembly into a web application. Uh, so this Jupyter lab uh, completely runs in your web browser. It doesn't require any server. It doesn't require any uh, resources beyond your, your, your machine. It doesn't require any installation and immediately you can start using it uh, and write uh, Python or, or JavaScript code uh, and, and test it as you wish. Uh, there are some um, JupyterLab uh, deployments, uh, deployments uh, provided by major cloud uh, providers. Uh, most well known is Google uh, Colab uh, Collaboratory, um, which provides free um, GPU also enabled uh, machines uh, where you can use a customized version of, of Jupyter. Uh, but there are also uh, additional services provided by, by Microsoft. Uh, by Azure Machine Learning Workspace and also by Amazon, uh, by uh, SageMaker. Uh, there is also a new development, which is Microsoft Planetary Computer, um, which is mainly uh, something I think interesting for ITC uh, because it is like a Google Earth engine, uh, but uh, on JupyterLab. So instead of writing the code in, in JavaScript, you can write a normal Python code and use all the uh, computing uh, facilities that are available including a uh, global data sets uh, and it runs on JupyterLab. Uh, but there are also some local options that you have. The first one is a UT computing platform. This is a new development. We are co-developing it with, uh, with Lisa uh, and it is accessible uh, through VPN or uh, if you are at ITC or, or UT, you can directly access it. And the last one is ITC Geospatial Computing Platform, which is in fact uh, operated by, by Crypt. Um, if you are uh, a user, in fact, one of these uh, 425 users of, of the platform, I think you already know uh, the capabilities, but very shortly, uh, Geospatial Computing Platform uh, is, a, is, a, is a managed uh, JupyterHub deployment, which allows you to, to, to access JupyterLab interface 
with more than 15 uh, languages uh, is interactive uh, kernels. Uh, and we are also providing additional services like uh, database servers, map servers, uh, code repositories, and data repositories, uh, which you can use with your UT account without any registration. Uh, we have also uh, machine learning frameworks and GPU-enabled computation facilities. So you can always use um, ITC uh, Geospatial Computing Platform to test uh, JupyterLab. Uh, but if you want to install it, uh, it is also very easy. Uh, so um, it can be installed by using different uh, package managers. Uh, Conda, uh, Mamba uh, are uh, quite uh, common package managers nowadays, uh, which helps you to install software package by, by only a single li line. But uh, if you want, you can also use a uh, Python uh, package manager pip uh, to, to install uh, JupyterLab. Uh, I have already provided a how-to document, uh, a short how-to document about how to install uh, Python, Node, uh, and um, JupyterLab. Uh, so uh, if you just follow follow the PDF document, you can very easily uh, install it. But basically what you need to do is just uh, install Python if you don't have it, install Node if you don't have it, and then just uh, install JupyterLab by uh, entering, for example, pip install JupyterLab. Uh, the package manager will will install all the dependencies and it will be ready to use. So it is really, really very easy to install. Um, before moving to um, to the interface of JupyterLab, uh, let's uh, see uh, some core components of, of Jupyter, which is also uh, equally valid for, for JupyterLab. Uh, the, the first one... Uh, yeah, is there a question? Uh, the first one uh, is the kernel. I'm good. Hi. Kernels are, are processes that run okay, interactive uh, okay, in a language, key. so it doesn't need to be a programming language. So, for example, um, on a geospatial computing platform, we have DOT, uh, which allows you to create uh, graphs, actually. Uh, so it is not a programming language, but it is still available as an interactive kernel um, and return the output. Uh, they also respond to uh, code completion and uh, in, uh, introspection request, which means um, um, request about um, the, the parameters of, of the variables, the types, etc. Uh, the kernels in uh, Jupyter run until they are terminated, which means shut down. So if you if you uh, close a document uh, which is connected to a kernel, it doesn't mean that your kernel is is shut down. So it continues to function. If it is computing something, it, it continues to compute, uh, compute that. And after some time, if you connect back to the, to the document or if you open a new document by connecting it to the kernel, then you can access the computation kernel and see the results. So this is very nice because this allows you to have long running tasks, computation tasks to be performed by using Jupyter kernels. Uh, there are uh, three core kernels developed by the Jupyter community. The first one is IPython, which is for Python. The second one is IR kernel, uh, which is the kernel for R language. And the last one is Julia. So iJulia is the kernel for, for the Julia language. And in fact, Jupyter term comes uh, from, uh, from, from the abbreviations of these three languages. Ju from Julia, P from Python and R from R. So Jupyter is coming from these three languages. Um, but in addition to these uh, kernels, there are also more than 150 community maintained kernels. So they are not official part of the Jupyter project, but there are many uh, dependent or sometimes independent uh, developers who develop kernels for, for different languages. Uh, and in fact, uh, if we click the link, uh, we can go to the listing and here you can see uh, there are plenty of different languages for which the kernels are available. So uh, in, in practice, uh, for almost any language of interest, uh, you can find a kernel available for, for Jupyter. Uh, but uh, the number might be a little bit misleading because first of all, some languages have multiple kernels. So a, a developer starts to develop a kernel 
and then another devo developer starts to develop a similar kernel for the same language. So eventually we have multiple kernels for the same language. Uh, not all the kernels are fully functional. Uh, most of the time uh, there are they are prototypes. Uh, they are not complete. They come to up to a certain point. Then the developer um, finds another another work becomes busy. They cannot continue. So all the almost all of them are open source. Uh, open source doesn't mean that they they are maintained all the time. So uh, there are many kernels which are uh, not complete. Uh, some of them are so not complete from from functionality point of view. So because a, a kernel uh, not only does the computation, but it should also uh, respond to a code completion request or uh, a variable inspection requests. And if they are not implemented in the kernel, that means that language cannot support such requests. And this is also a, a common situation for, for, for many kernels. And some of them, in fact, are also outdated. So if you check the list, you will find kernels which were developed uh, nine years ago, six years ago. And, and as we saw, uh, the Jupyter ecosystem is very dynamic. They are uh, adding new features uh, almost each month. So from that point of view, a kernel which is developed nine years ago uh, is really a, a questionable in terms of performance and also in terms of security. Um, the second component uh, is the code consoles. Uh, the code consoles allows to run uh, code interactively uh, in a kernel. So they are a client. Um, they show uh, the order of execution uh, in the order of execution. So uh, by using a code console, you cannot change the order uh, in which you run the code, uh, but they can display a rich output. So if the computation uh, produce a HTML uh, output, you can you see it as a HTML output, or if it produce a, a, a graph, you see it as a graph. Um, they can be connected to running kernels. So uh, um, as I mentioned, a, a kernel, uh, does not respond to only a single client. The different clients can connect to the same kernel to collect information from it. So from that point of view, they, they, the code consoles also can connect to kernels. And this allows, first of all, interactivity uh, for to inspect and run code without disturbing other connected clients. Uh, this is a very nice uh, feature, in fact, because let's say you have a notebook and you are doing some computation which takes a lot of time, but meanwhile you want to follow the computation. So what are the values of a matrix or what are the values of variables during the computation? By connecting a, a, a console to the running kernel, in fact, you can ask this question without disturbing the running notebook. Uh, and also they can act as, as, as logging uh, for for the ongoing computation. As I mentioned, if you close a, a, a console, the kernel still continues to run, so you can reconnect either by using a console or by using a notebook to the same kernel. The third component uh, of, of the Jupyter and Jupyter Lab uh, is the text editor. So uh, the text editor uh, allows you to edit uh, the text files directly uh, in, in the Jupyter Lab or in Jupyter Notebook uh, interface. Uh, the text editor uh, uh, provides uh, language specific syntax highlighting. So different keywords uh, or, or uh, sections of, of your code will be colored uh, so that you can easily differentiate comments, for example, from, from, from the actual uh, code itself. Uh, they follow, they allow t t teams. So if you like uh, a dark uh, team, um, which is also maybe better for your eyes. You can switch to a dark theme, or if you prefer to have a white background, you can also switch to a, a white theme. And the editor uh, allows you to map the keys. Uh, and for that purpose, they support also some major uh, editors, especially from, from, from Unix, uh, like Vim, uh, Emacs, and uh, Sublime Text. So if you are already uh, users of this uh, text uh, console based text editors, uh, you can use the same uh, key mapping uh, by using the text editor, which uh, sig will significantly speed up your, your typing. 
and the indentation of the tabs uh, can be configurable and also the text editor allows auto closure of the blanket uh, brackets so uh, this is also something sometimes very useful while writing the code and the capabilities of the text editors can be enhanced by 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 uh, uh, by several extensions for example uh, the code compression which is normally not supported uh, in the text editors can be added by installing a specific extension or you can also install a spell checker, uh, which will um, check your uh, your narrative uh, for uh, for spelling errors. Um, a file can be opened uh, simultaneously in multiple editors um, and also viewers, and they are uh, kept in in sign, in sign. So that means they are synchronized. So if you edit uh, the, the the file in one editor and save it, uh, then the other editor is automatically updated to reflect the changes. And this is also the case with the viewers. So if you edit, for example, a, a, a markdown uh, markup text, then the viewer, which shows uh, the, the output of, of, of that uh, narrative, will automatically update. Um, one important uh, information could be the views may not be updated if the file content is invalid. So if you, for example, are editing a JSON file, and if you if you if your JSON uh, is not a proper JSON, then uh, in fact uh, the editor will show it as it is, but the viewer will not update uh, the display because uh, the, the content is not not proper. Uh, the text files, uh, like text consoles, can be uh, connected to uh, the kernels. Um, this is also a very nice uh, feature because let's say you have a document which includes some uh, some code sections, but also some some narrative. So normally, if you load this file in in Python or in, in another language, and uh, the, the code will not run because the interpreter or or the programming language will not recognize the narrative section. But in case of uh, the text editor, basically uh, you can very easily run uh, the code without leaving the text editor and see the results in a connected uh, console or or viewer. Um, and this uh, functionality is also available for code blocks. So if you indicate a code block and if you if you uh, if you uh, indicate the language of of the block, then the system can run it with the with the uh, specified language kernel and provide the output. Um, another <clears throat> component um, is is the terminal. So uh, Jupyter also allows you to use uh, terminals. Uh, which are available on your system. Uh, so on Linux or, or Mac, they are usually Bash or Z shell. Um, and on Windows, it is usually the PowerShell. Uh, so that means any text-based program that is running on your machine or the machine that you are connected um, will be available and accessible uh, through the Jupyter interface. Uh, you can copy paste content from the terminals so if there is an editor there, you can paste a content to the editor, or if there is there is a text message there, you can copy and paste in your uh, editor, which is running on your, your machine. Um, one important information, the terminals run with the privileges that you have on that machine. So if you are using Jupyter or Jupyter Lab on your laptop, and if you are not the administrator, then unfortunately, the terminal will also not have administrator privileges. But if you are connected to to a remote server where you have also uh, administrator rights, in that case, you can use these administrator rights also in the terminal that you use uh, through the Jupyter. Uh, like uh, code consoles, uh, uh, the terminals are also not terminated when you close them, so uh, you can always go back and and uh, continue uh, your work. But one critic information, uh, if you close a terminal and if you open it again, unfortunately, the screen content is not uh, saved. So if if there is a, a content like, like here, we have Midnight Commander and we see uh, the, the files that are uh, available uh, on that machine. Unfortunately, when you come back, you will see a blank screen and it will be only refreshed if you refresh uh, the Midnight Commander. So this is something you should uh, you should you should know. Uh, and finally, uh, the most important component of Jupyter and Jupyter Lab is is the notebooks. 
So uh, the Jupyter Notebooks are documents combining live runnable code with narrative text, equations, images, interactive components, and also all other rich output. Um, and they are composed of multiple cells. So basically, uh, a cell can be a code cell, as you can see here, um, or it can be a, a narrative, a text cell, like you, you can see here. There is also a third type of, of, of cell, which is raw, and the raw content is not processed by Jupyter and it is displayed as it is. Um, each notebook is connected to a kernel, so it is not possible to connect a notebook to multiple kernels. Um, and um, when they send uh, the code to the kernel and uh, receive the output, they indicate the execution order. And unlike the code consoles, you can change the execution order. So you can start, for example, from the first cell, you can run it, which will make it number one. You can continue to the second one and run it and make it uh, number two. Then you can go back to the one and run it again. So in that case, in fact, you will lose at the first cell and it becomes number three. And, and that might be sometimes the reason if you if you open a, a notebook uh, and see uh, the numbers out of order. That means uh, the, the the person who who saved uh, the notebook, in fact, didn't run the notebook in the order it is indicated, um, which might be sometimes uh, problematic. Um, so, uh, and this is mainly the main difference between the code consoles uh, and the notebooks. So. Um, um, as I mentioned, uh, the outputs um, can be rich content, so it, it doesn't need to be plain text. Um, and, and Jupyter, uh, by default, without installing any additional extensions or, or, or software, uh, supports several output formats. Uh, the first one is Markdown. Uh, Markdown uh, is, is a markup language, uh, which is uh, quite simple, which allows you to enter a text uh, uh, by using ASCII characters, which, uh, if interpreted, becomes a formatted text. So you can very easily indicate uh, headers, uh, subheaders, list items, ordered list items, links, etc. Uh, and by default, uh, the narrative uh, of the Jupyter notebooks are in Markdown. Uh, the second uh, format that is supported by, by Jupyter uh, is, is images. So uh, it supports various images like PNG files, JPEG files, but uh, also uh, SWG uh, for vector uh, graphics and uh, bitmap files. So you can open them, you can open in, in, um, um, in, in the lab environment, and if you want, you can also modify some of their um, properties. Um, delimited separated values uh, are also uh, supported. So most common one is comma separated values file, so CSV. Um, so you can very easily load a CSV and visualize it without using any other software package. Um, there are some limitations, uh, but the limitations, to be honest, are quite, uh, quite acceptable. So if you use Firefox, for example, you can open a CSV up to one gigabyte. Um, but one gigabyte CSV is in fact a quite big data anyway. So, and most probably, even if you use it, uh, if you try to open it with Excel, you won't, you won't be able to open. But uh, Jupyter Lab uh, can can open it. But of course, it may slow down a lot. Uh, it also supports JSON files, so it, it shows the JSONs in a tree st structure, so you can see the content very easily. It 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 can show HTML files. Uh, it can show uh, LaTeX files uh, with some limitations. Uh, the LaTeX support is in fact for uh, mathematical equations, so only a subset of uh, LaTeX is, is supported um, by, by, by the system. Uh, it can also display PDF files, uh, also inline, but by using the uh, PDF display uh, functionality of, of the web browser, so it doesn't have an internal uh, PDF viewer for that purpose. Uh, but it can also um, um, visualize uh, Vega, VegaLit, and Virtual DOM documents, which are mainly used for interactive widgets uh, and usually uh, used by software developers, but not uh, by the end users. 
uh, by installing uh, additional extensions, uh, you, you can also um, have additional support for different formats. For example, GeoJSON uh, is supported by, by an extension, so uh, you can visualize GeoJSONs on map very easily, or uh, you can display also HDF5 uh, files, even very large files. Uh, with uh, with JupyterLab if you install the extension. Then we come uh, to, to the interface. So uh, when you open JupyterLab, in, in fact, you, you, you come across uh, the simplified version of this, but uh, it is possible to arrange it in this way. So, um, and what we have um, um, in essence uh, are as follows. Uh, the first one is, is the main menu, so it's like a normal uh, Windows applic a, a, a application in window uh, format, so we have the main menu. Uh, then we have two sidebars, one sidebar on the right with, uh, with common tasks, for example, uh, the file browser, uh, list of running uh, kernels or uh, table of contents of the active notebook. Uh, on the left hand side, there is another sidebar bar, which allows you to access uh, first of all, the properties um, page uh, of the of the cell that is uh, currently active, um, which is very useful to enter metadata uh, if you want to do so. And the, another one is the debugger. Uh, that's also on the left sidebar. Uh, there is a status bar uh, at the bottom, which provides you some uh, information about uh, the number of running kernels, uh, the, the running uh, extensions, uh, there are some uh, um, uh, language uh, support functionality that's available through some extensions and they are, they are, they are listed there. Uh, it also provides the name of active um, notebook, etc. Uh, the file browser uh, allows you to, to manage the files uh, and folders uh, through a normal uh, tree-like uh, interface. Uh, there is a launcher which allows you to, to open new uh, notebooks, or if there are some applications that are installed on JupyterLab, you can also access those applications by using the, the launcher and by clicking the, the icons. Uh, we have uh, the, the notebooks. So uh, the notebooks uh, uh, can be uh, layout in different ways. The JupyterLab, in fact, uh, provides a tab interface where uh, the notebooks can, can be put side by side. Or if you want, you can also lay out, lay out them uh, by using tiles. That is also possible. Uh, we have the consoles. Um, and there is also a specific console uh, for logging purposes. So any messages like information messages, warning messages, or error messages that are sent by the uh, kernels can be uh, listed here. Um, the good thing is you can you can set the type of uh, message that you want to see. So, for example, you can disable information messages and enable only uh, error messages so that uh, you, you don't have a complete, um, uh, you don't have a very long list of, of messages or it can be the opposite. Uh, in, the, in the notebook, you can disable the information managers, uh, messages and in the log, you can enable them to see all the details regarding the computation. Uh, and finally, we have a, a command palette. Uh, so, and through the command palette, in fact, you can access all the commands that are available on the JupyterLab interface. Uh, so, I will show uh, this interface later in the second half of, 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 of the training. Um, and uh, basically, I put also some information here in the presentation because I will share it and uh, you, you can have a look uh, how to access uh, some of these uh, this, this functions. Uh, two important things that I didn't mention in the previous slide. Uh, the context menu is also available by clicking right the mouse button, which allows you to access additional uh, functions uh, related to the console or, or notebook that you are working on. Um, but as you know, context menu is also used by the, by the browser itself, so it is also possible to access the native context menu by a shift right click. Um, for, uh, for people who prefer to use a software, not in English, but in, 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 in your native language, uh, it is also possible starting from uh, JupyterLab 3 uh, to have a, a, a native language support. So there are uh, about 30 different languages that are supported. Uh, but uh, the language pack needs to be installed, uh, otherwise uh, they are not listed. 
Um, the interface that I mentioned, so all these tabs and, and the tiles, uh, sometimes we really want to have a certain type of layout because it is more effective for us. And we want to have the same setup each time we, we use the software. Uh, this is possible uh, in JupyterLab. Uh, so these layouts called workspaces. So uh, in a workspace, in fact, uh, JupyterLab stores uh, the state uh, of, of, of the files, which files are open and how the windows are, are tiled. You can save a workspace uh, to, to, to your uh, file system. And next time uh, you can load it. And even you can share workspaces with other people. And if uh, the people that you share uh, the workspace uh, have access uh, to the same files, they will have identical working environment with you. Uh, one important information, uh, the workspace that you work uh, currently are, are the default workspace and it is always saved. So uh, if, you, if you shut down uh, your uh, JupyterLab session and restart again, uh, you don't uh, come with the empty workspace. In fact, JupyterLab automatically loads the default one and displays the last situation, last state with all the files and notebooks visible to you. Um, regarding file management, um, the file browser allows you to open, create, delete, move, rename files uh, quite easily. Uh, the directory you start JupyterLab uh, is very important because that directory becomes the root directory uh, of the file browser and you cannot go uh, down to that folder. So if you start, for example, from a, a from C drive uh, on Windows and at the temp directory, then you cannot uh, view display files which are under C drive. You can only see the files that are under the temp directory and the sub directories. Um, this is something important. Uh, the directory listing is aut uh, automatically updated. So that means if somehow you copy files or you delete files from, from your file system, they are reflected automatically by the Jup Jupyter Lab. And how easy uh, to, to manage your files uh, is partly depends on the type of deployment that you have at Jupyter Lab. If you are using Jupyter Lab on your own machine, then it is very easy because you can copy paste files by using your, your normal web browser or a file browser that is provided by the operating system. In that case, JupyterLab just updates the files, uh, the listing as you change. It is very easy to delete folders. It is very uh, easy to, to create archive which contains uh, folders and subfolders. But if you are using a remote JupyterLab deployment, then in fact, this can be quite challenging because unfortunately, file browser does not have uh, functionalities to download a complete uh, folder with all subfolders or files, or even it cannot delete from sometimes a, a folder if there are some files inside the folder. So it becomes partly challenging. Um, uploads and downloads. So if you use the file browser that's available uh, in, in JupyterLab, they are uh, handled through the web browser. So that means you, you, you need to obey the limitations of the web browser. Sometimes you may not upload very large files or uh, copying files may take some time because it, will, it has to be done through the HTTP protocol. Uh, there are some extensions available uh, which can facilitate file management and I will talk about them later. Um, one important information, when you create a file like a notebook or, or a code uh, text document, it is automatically saved to the Active Directory. So it is not like a creating a file, creates a file in the memory and it is not stored uh, on, on, on the drive unless you save it explicitly. In case of JupyterLab, it is saved by default initially and it is, it is named also by using a default name, which you need to change later. If you don't, uh, eventually you will have untitled one, untitled two, untitled three and like many, uh, files in your in, in your directory, which which is sometimes difficult to to uh, keep, keep track of. Um, JupyterLab also has a kind of a simple uh, history and versioning uh, system, which is called a uh, checkpoints. So whenever you create a file, it creates uh, automatically a hidden folder, 
in, inside the Active Directory, and it stores copies of, of the files that you are working on uh, in that hidden directory as checkpoints. And this allows you to, first of all, uh, go back in time. Uh, if you do something uh, by mistake, if you do delete a cell, it might be possible to revert back this change by reverting back to a checkpoint. Or otherwise, if by mistake or uh, due to the cutoff network connection, you lose connection uh, to a remote Jupyter lab, uh, this checkpoint will uh, allow Jupyter lab to keep the latest uh, state uh, of the document. And once you connect back, you will access the latest version, but not a version that is before. So this is really nice. But you should you should know that this uh, creating a hidden directory uh, will be done automatically. And if you start to use Jupyter Lab from different directories in your in your machine, then in each directory you will have these hidden directories, which may include a lot of files. So in that case, uh, be careful and try to not to pollute your system. So my suggestion is to use a single directory and keep everything under that directory and run JupyterLab also from that directory. Um, the good thing about Jupyter Notebooks, uh, they are in fact JSON files, very simple JSON files. So uh, you can open them by using a text editor and see the content. Uh, that means they can also very easy to uh, to uh, uh, to track changes. So if you use a, 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 a diff tool like a win merge or a diff command uh, on Linux, you can very easily see the changes that you have between two versions of 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 the notebooks, and you can share those files also with with others. So um, and they can be displayed. Uh, by using a Jupyter or Jupyter Lab or with a compatible software, because right now there are different um, integrated development environments like uh, Visual, Visual Code, uh, Py, PyCharm, um, um, which allows uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, to be to open within the interactive development environment. So it is possible to to open them directly without having Jupyter installed. But there are some things that you should be aware of. The first one, uh, not the, not all of the output that you see on your machine might be visible to others, especially this is the case with interactive widgets. So if you have a notebook in which you have a Google Maps widget, which shows a certain type of map, it may not be displayed because uh, that Google Maps, in fact, is requires a JavaScript code to run. And unless uh, the notebook is a trusted notebook, it is not possible uh, to, to run it on other users' machine. So in that case, you won't see the output, but you will just see a message. Uh, the dependencies that you have in your notebook. So for example, if you use certain Python packages to do the computation, like NumPy uh, or some uh, 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 additional uh, packages like Panda, GeoPandas, etc. In that case, uh, the, the notebook files do not include any of these dependencies. So uh, the, the person that you share the notebook should have them installed uh, on uh, his or her platform to be able to run the notebook that you send. This is also the same with, with external assets. So if a notebook is using a data set from your file system, or if it is reading a CSV file and processing it, uh, this External files are, are not inside the Jupyter Notebook file. So that means while sharing the Jupyter Notebook, you should also share uh, all these external assets together. And that's why most of the time people either uh, create a folder, put everything underneath, and then send an archive of, of that folder to other people so that they can extract and use it. Or they create a code repositories like on, on GitHub or some, some, somewhere else, and they put everything there, and other people, they, they pull the code repository with all the notebook files and the external assets so that they can create identical uh, environment. Um, of course, this doesn't include the packages that are required. Uh, in that case, one option could be to use Docker 
So you can create a Docker file and you can uh, indicate in Docker file everything that is necessary. Um, and then the other party can infect, uh, run a Docker container and run your code. Um, the next training that we will provide will be in fact about Docker and how to create Docker containers, how to run them. So if you are interested in this, uh, which might be especially useful for uh, reproducible uh, research outputs, uh, then uh, please follow our announcements and uh, follow also the Docker uh, training. Um, sending the Jupyter notebook file is only one way to share it, share it, but there are also other options. So if you are just only interested in 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 the in the uh, output, the result, the visual part of it, you can also export the notebook into different formats. Uh, several formats are supported uh, by by Jupyter Lab and Jupyter. So uh, uh, some of the important ones are first of all PDF. So if required uh, packages are installed on your machine or the remote machine that you are working on, you can you can export your notebook as a PDF and share it. Uh, another one is LaTeX. So uh, you, you can you can get the LaTeX output and then you can put it in your article directly or you can put it in your book which you write in LaTeX. So it is also uh, quite convenient. And the last one. Uh, is the reveal uh, uh, slides. So reveal.js uh, is a nice um, a software which allows you create interactive uh, presentations uh, that run on, on the web browser. And uh, it is possible to export Jupyter not notebooks uh, as this kind of presentations, uh, which you can uh, display uh, by using a web browser. So that means either you can, you, if, if you present during a course, you can use your machine, your web browser to display it, or you can upload it to somewhere and people in fact can, can see uh, your notebook as a pre presentation. Uh, and the nice thing is, uh, by using the metadata of, 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 of the computing cells, you can indicate at uh, the start of the next slide, you can put some slide notes and you can uh, structure your presentation as you wish. Uh, and the output put is usually uh, quite pleasant. So I can also highly suggest uh, if you want to use a Jupyter notebooks for, for education purposes. Um, of course, there are some limitations. Uh, some formats may require additional software packages, and sometimes you need to enter some custom metadata to make them work properly. Um, one uh, nice addition uh, to, to Jupyter Lab in the version 3 uh, was the debugger. Uh, so uh, notebooks, code, code, code source, and the files uh, can be debugged directly uh, from, from JupyterLab. Um, a kernel with debugging support is required for that purpose. Luckily, uh, the IPy kernel uh, had this support quite recently, so it is now possible to use the default Python kernel uh, for, for debugging. But there are also two additional uh, kernels, one for Python and one for uh, robot um, um, uh, language. Uh, and probably uh, there will be more uh, kernels which will support debugging starting by R. And we may see also uh, debugging support uh, for, for those languages in JupyterLab. Uh, I will show in the second part the debugging uh, and how it works. Uh, another new feature that is available um, um, in the latest version of uh, JupyterLab is real-time collaboration. Uh, as you know, uh, if you edit a document uh, on um, by using Microsoft Office Online or if you edit through Google Docs, uh, you can edit it collaboratively. So uh, multiple people can connect at the same time and you see them uh, and what they do. And it is now exactly the same also for, for Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so it is possible to, to connect to the same notebook uh, by dif different people. You can see what they are doing and what they editing. Um, but this feature is uh, very new. Uh, it is not completely developed yet, and uh, it also uh, provides a full access rights uh, to, to, to the person that you share uh, the, the uh, workbook, uh, including uh, your files. Uh, so you should be careful uh, while using this uh, new feature, but it is available and most probably in time it will get better and it will get better quite rapidly. Um, the last thing is the user settings. 
So there are many uh, components of, of the Jupyter Lab, Lab interface which you can modify. So you can modify the tab uh, size. So you can set four spaces for the tab or two spaces for the tab. You can change the font. You can change the photo font of the user interface or the colors, or you can disable a date column in the file browser. So all these kind of things can be done by, by using two, uh, two, two ways. The first one is the settings menu. Uh, some important settings are available under the menu, so you can change them from there. And the others are available under advanced settings part, where uh, you, you can edit them directly. Um, um, uh, and in that case, you need to edit a JSON code, but it's, it's very simple. Um, and the system defaults, uh, which is in fact a, a JSON file, uh, is provided as a template, a read on the template, and that template also includes uh, the description of the property and what are the valid options that are available for that property. So ju just by reading it, you can very easily uh, customize uh, your settings. Um, once they are changed, they are permanent. Uh, some of the changes uh, are uh, implemented immediately. So, but for, for some of them, you may need to restart your Jupyter knob. And this is especially the case with the extensions, the settings of the extensions. Um, and this brings us uh, to, to the extensions. So uh, JupyterLab uh, is, is designed as an extendable environment, and, and extensions can in fact customize any part of JupyterLab. And you can in fact see JupyterLab as a collection of extensions that are developed for different purposes. So it is possible to have new teams, new file weavers, new renderers for different uh, file formats. Um, there are many two types of extensions. Uh, one is the source extension, so that means uh, you have the source code uh, of, of the extension and uh, you install the so source code of, of the extension and that requires the Jupyter lab to be rebuilt completely from scratch. Uh, that takes some time, sometimes uh, some some time, so uh, you should be, uh, you should accept that it will take time. Um, the other one, which is quite new, this is available with uh, version 3 of JupyterLab. They are pre-built extensions. Uh, if you install a pre-built extension, it becomes uh, available immediately without any, any delay. Uh, there are different ways to install extensions. The first one is to use package managers. So like you use a pip install JupyterLab, you can also tell a pip install JupyterLab uh, GeoJSON. And in that case, the JupyterLab GeoJSON uh, extension will be installed with all the dependencies. So uh, most of the time it is very easy. Uh, there is an extension manager which is uh, integrated to JupyterLab. You can use this extension manager to install extensions. Um, but you should be aware that some extensions may require additional software packages. So uh, if you install, for example, HD5, HDF5 uh, file viewer, uh, it will need HDF5 library to be installed on the on the system. So unless you install it on your machine or if it is uh, installed uh, to 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 the remote server, uh, the extension won't work uh, properly. Um, and as I mentioned, some extensions may need restart. Um, there are some popular extensions. Uh, I just listed them here for for your information. So. Uh, you can have a look at the table, and if you find some of the extensions useful, you can install it to your own machine. Uh, all of these extensions are, in fact, installed on the geospatial computing platform. So basically, we have an extension for Dusk, which allows you to, to monitor a uh, computing cluster running uh, Dusk tasks. Uh, we have Jupyter Archive extension, which allows you to download a complete uh, directory with all files and subdirectories by a single click. Uh, we have the TensorFlow extension, which allows you to access uh, TensorFlow uh, outputs and visualize them uh, very easily. Uh, there is a chart editor, which allows you to, to edit plotly charts. So you can save plotly charts as a file and then update everything. You can change the color, you can change the type of chart, you can put, uh, put um, some additional information. Uh, it is really easy. Uh, there is a Draw.io extension, which allows you to, 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 to create uh, flow charts. Uh, by using a visual interface. And we have also additional many ex extensions. Um, I only want to uh, emphasize the last one, JupyterLab Proxy uh, UI, uh, which is very important because that extension 
in fact allows you uh, to uh, to to run web applications within the windows in Jupyter Lab uh, installation. And uh, this is in fact the, the extension which allows us to have remote desktop connection or uh, some additional uh, task dashboards uh, that are available on Jupyter Lab. Um, remote desktop is by default not a part of Jupyter project. So it is an external package which you just edit by using this uh, proxy extension. Um, most of the extensions are available under NPM, uh, so not a package manager a repository, and you can find them very easily by entering keywords Jupyter Lab extension search query. Um, there are also some additional resources uh, that I listed. So uh, most of them are documentation. So Jupyter really, uh, because they are a very big community, they also value documentation a lot. It is very detailed, so you can find many information. Some of them are for the nerds. So the, the icons with eyeglasses are, are the nerds. So uh, IPython, Python client, and uh, the, the source code itself, because in fact you can have a look at the source code to understand how it works, are more for more technical people. Uh, but the basic documentation is very pleasant to read, so you can just, uh, just have a look. Um, and in fact, you can contribute also. So you don't need to be a very good programmer. Uh, uh, and even as a, a new newcomer, uh, while reading a documentation, if you see a mistake, you can very easily correct, and that becomes, in fact, a contribution uh, to the community, um, which is always welcomed. So uh, this is all highly suggested. And uh, for any questions, uh, you can also contact us, and we will be happy to uh, provide you more detailed information. Uh, about Jupyter, Jupyter ecosystem, Jupyter Lab, and also other uh, topics related to uh, cloud computing and big data in general. Um, with this, actually, um, uh, I complete the first part. Um, the idea was to to talk about all the components of Jupyter Lab and uh, try to uh, provide you information about what it is, what it is not, how it is it was started, and where it is now. Uh, I hope. If you are new to Jupyter Lab, uh, you have a better idea about the ecosystem. And if somebody tells you Jupyter Hub, you will know what Jupyter Hub is and what is the, what is its difference uh, between uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, in, in the next part, uh, after a five minutes of break, um, we will see it in action. Do you have any questions so far? Yes, Andre. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, would you be so kind to let us know a little bit about uh, the security of using the platform? I think this is a very important issue. Yes. And I would like to hear about it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. So to be honest, when I first saw it, I was shocked because, uh, well, I have a lot of uh, web application development experience, so more than 20, 25 years. And partly, Jupyter allows uh, arbitrary code execution on, on the system. So that means that is what the hacker is looking for. So because you, you run the code and you have complete access to, uh, to the machine that you are working on. So and that might be really a security issue. So uh, what I can tell you, uh, if you run it on your uh, personal machine, uh, it is quite secure because uh, when you run Jupyter Lab, uh, it runs as a web application, but it is only accessible if you provide a token. And the token is only displayed to you while running the Jupyter Lab instance, and uh, nobody else can access Jupyter unless they have access to, uh, to the token. So uh, from that point of view, using it on your machine is, is quite safe. And if you still have some doubts, you can always uh, disconnect internet because it is not necessary to have internet connection to use it locally. Uh, for, for, for the remote server deployments, uh, this is partly a, a question uh, to the uh, platform operator because there are many components. So uh, partly, um, I, I think we need maybe at least half a day a course to, to go into the details of Jupyter Hub, how it works, etc. But uh, if the operator follows best practices, 
uh, then it is also uh, quite safe. Um, but uh, there is also uh, there might be of course some 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 risk uh, if somebody uh, has somehow access to um, to to the notebook interface and execute arbitrary code. That is why most of the Jupyter Lab uh, deployments are running on Docker. Uh, so uh, with Docker, you have a virtualization. So uh, the user doesn't have direct access to the actual machine. So they are running on virtual machines and um, in individual machines, you don't have access to all the resources that you have. And even if you access, it is within that virtual machine, which is a very controlled environment. So from, from that point of view, I think uh, a Jupyter Lab uh, or Jupyter Hub deployment running on a Docker uh, is is safe, which is also the case for geospatial computing platform. So don't hesitate to use it. Uh, it is really uh, qu quite safe, and we are also following uh, best practices. And we are also uh, right now doing a security uh, security a security check uh, of the platform. Any other questions? There is one in the chat if you follow that. Yes. Uh, the first one, yeah, I will show um, the hands on. I will show uh, just um, soon. Um, is it possible to keep executing a program in remote Jupyter Lab when client is disconnected? Uh, yes, of course, because uh, as long as the kernel is running, uh, it will continue the computation. So you can start the computation and let the kernel run. Uh, and uh, with the client, you can connect it from time to time to follow. Um, but this partly also depends on, on other factors. So for example, in our case, uh, for, for the geospatial computing platform, a kernel which is not uh, interacted uh, for one hour, and if it is not doing a computation, it is terminated automatically. So in that case, uh, you, you can reconnect within one hour, but after one hour, the kernel is not there, so you cannot access it. OK, uh, if there are no other questions, so just uh, let's have a short break, so maybe two, three minutes. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I will prepare the Jupyter app interface and I will show uh, how it works.
Okay, um, let's start um, with, the, with, the, with the demonstration of, of JupyterLab uh, and how it works. Uh, so, um, I already sent the installation uh, document. I hope uh, you man managed to install it. If, if not, uh, um, you can use a geospatial computing platform or uh, other um, websites that I, I mentioned. Maybe I can also share the links in just a second. Uh, this is try try Jupiter, and this one is uh, Jupiter light. Uh, if you have a Google account, you can use uh, Google Collaboratory, which is also uh, quite nice. Uh, if you are at ITC or if your VPN is on, you can use UT computing platform and for 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 the rest you can use um, our platform okay uh, now uh, I'm in my com command prompt uh, and I have a Jupyter lab installed uh, on, on the machine so in order to run uh, Jupyter you just uh, enter Jupyter and then lab and then uh, hit enter uh, then uh, the Jupyter lab, lab starts and it, it opens uh, it opens uh, the Jupyter lab interface, which is, which is like this. Um, you will see also some notes here. Uh, one important part is the HTTP uh, URL uh, that, that is displayed. So uh, if you somehow close your web browser and if you need to access again the Jupyter Lab, you can use this URL address. And as I mentioned, there is this token here, which is only visible to you. So unless uh, somebody provides this, this token, it is not possible to access your uh, local uh, Jupyter Lab instance. Um, the basic installation uh, just have the Python. So uh, just to give an example, I have also installed R uh, here. So we have also R kernel that is available. Uh, the user interface uh, has uh, the top menu, the sidebars, the file browser, uh, the, the launcher, and then we have also the status bar. By clicking the icons uh, here, you can create a notebook. Uh, I think this is a really Murphy situation. Let me switch to uh, RJ Special Computing Platform. Um, by clicking the icon, you can create a notebook. And the notebook interface has some icons here to, to save the content, uh, to copy paste the content, and uh, you can choose uh, the type of, of the cells that you have. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two, three types of, of uh, code cells. Uh, the first one is, is the code in the language and that is set as the kernel. Here, in this case, it's Python. You can indicate a markdown, uh, which is for, for narratives, and then the row is displayed as it is. Uh, here, you can enter uh, a, a, a normal code. So this is Python, so we can en enter a hello world here. And to run a code, you enter shift enter. So and shift enter runs the uh, the code that, that you have. Uh, you can define variables. So for example, we can set a equal to 10 and b equal to uh, 20 in one cell. And then just by entering the variable name uh, gives the display, the, the value. It displays the value of, of the variable. Uh, it is possible to define functions. 
So we can define an add function in which we can use a and b and then return a plus b. And if you say c is equal to a plus b and then display the output, you get 30. So it is running as a normal uh, Python uh, interpreter, in fact, with some additional capabilities. Uh, because first of all, uh, we have code completion. So if A is equal to hello, hello world, uh, then you can uh, enter A and dot, and then if you click the top, uh, or just wait for it, if you have the extension available, then you see all the functions that are defined for, for that variable. So in this case, this is string. So we see all uh, all the parameters, all, all the string functions where they are they are they are defined and what they do. So in this case, capitalize is uh, is defined in built-ins, and then it returns a, a string. So if we run this and assign it to be, you have uh, maybe. Uh, it, it capitalized the string uh, by following the um, the sentence uh, capitalization rules. Um, as you saw, I run um, the cell again a uh, second time. So basically, um, you can modify the content of a cell. If you modify it, it is indicated as, as modified and shown, shown in, in orange. And if you run it again, it will increase its, its number, and then you will see the new result. Um, the JupyterLab interface allows you to move the cells from one point to, to another, so you can arrange them easily. But at the same time, you can also run them it, it, in any order. So, uh, for example, let's say one A and A is equal to 10 and B is equal to 20. And then at the bottom, let's make B 30. If we come back, to this cell and run it, then we will get 40 as a result. Because although we defined B20 here, we set it as 30 at a later stage and then we add it here. That is why the order of um, the, the numbering of the cells is very important. And this is something you should always uh, take in, into consideration while looking at uh, some notebooks, especially which are coming from, from somebody else unless they are run in, in the proper order, uh, it doesn't mean that it follows uh, the order as defined here in, in, in the notebook. Um, under the kernel menu, it is possible to shut down a kernel or you can restart a kernel. And if you restart, all the variables that are defined here, the values, uh, they, they get restarted. So they all have zero values. And you can run also the complete um, notebook uh, by, by saying restart kernel and run all cells. In that case, the system will automatically run all the cells. And if there is a problem, it will give you the error message. So in this case, uh, we are asking for the value of A without defining A. So I move this here and then I, I run it again. In that case, it will it, it works uh, properly. So um, mod modifying the code and changing the order is, is very easy if you use a Jupyter lab interface. Um, the code cells um, can be changed into uh, documentation cells. So here, if you if you change uh, the code into Markdown, you can write a Markdown uh, text here which is very easy. So if you start with a, uh, with a hash, uh, it, it becomes a heading. If you enter two uh, hashes, it becomes a subheading and it continues like this. Uh, any text, text that you enter um, without uh, spaces, spaced lines becomes a paragraph. So here text and uh, other text are in fact a single paragraph. And in order to create a second paragraph, you need to have at least a line in between. 
if you start a line with numbering, it becomes a numbered list. So this is item one and this is item two. And you can start also like uh, by asterisk to create a, a unnumbered item, which is like like this. Uh, the URL addresses are automatically recognized. So if you enter uh, a URL, then it becomes a link, but also it is possible to enter a URL and indicate also uh, a text for it. So in this case, this will become ITC. And the code we have here uh, can be turned into a code block. Um, three, um, three ticks uh, creates a code block. And in this case, uh, it is a Python code. And then we will finish um, the code block like this. So here, shift enter runs the cell again. But this time, instead of running it through the uh, Jupyter kernel, it will use uh, the markdown. Um, interpreter and convert it into into uh, a display based on the markdown text that we entered so we have the heading we have the subheading we have we have the paragraph here the text and other text are uh, in the same paragraph because there was no uh, empty line between them but the second paragraph was separated in fact by a by a line and then we have we have the lists and the, and the urls etc uh, we have um, a, a table of contents section on the on the uh, left sidebar, um, and this part automatically displays all the headings and subheadings in the notebook. So, especially for large notebooks, which includes a lot of information, you can very easily navigate within the notebook by using the table of contents uh, component of of JupyterLab. Another component uh, on the left sidebar is the file browser. So here, as you can see, we have folders and we have files that are available. The files with uh, I, P, and B uh, are um, notebook files. So if you double click, they will be opened. Uh, if the kernel is, is not defined, it will ask you to choose a kernel. Here on the geospatial computing platform, we have many languages, but this one is in, in Python. So we can set uh, the, the uh, kernel in Python, and then automatically the system will uh, highlight the syntax and you can run the code as we saw before. Um, there are also uh, other file types here listed. So one of them is in fact a, a comma separated variable file. Um, if I open it by clicking, by double click, then JupyterLab uses the default viewer or editor of that file type, but it is also possible uh, to open it with a different editor. So in this case, I will choose the plain editor. And here we see the actual content of, of this uh, CSV file, which is in fact tab separated. And then the other view uh, is, is the uh, view coming from spreadsheet extension. Uh, I see her hand. Uh, yes, Serkan. Um, you, you're giving now a tutorial like we could probably find on, on YouTube or so about it. But can you somehow spend the next 15 minutes on like showing us examples of how this has been used already at ITC or at the UT community for education or, or, uh, or research? And, and just to, to get a bit of an idea of, of for whom it is useful in the context of, of ITC and the UT. Uh, I can talk some of the examples, so I didn't prepare a content like that, but I can tell you uh, the, the examples. So uh, we have around 35 projects at ITC who are using uh, JupyterLab um, and uh, JupyterHub, in fact, uh, for, for computation purposes. Um, most of them are uh, master and PhD thesis studies, and they are using it for mainly machine learning purposes. So uh, they have their uh, uh, machine learning workflows, uh, mostly written in Python, and they are they are using uh, the Jupyter Lab uh, to to compute um, these workflows and get the outputs. Uh, there are some courses uh, uh, which are using uh, this, this uh, platform, Jupyter Lab, uh, also for for teaching purposes. Uh, so we have Canvas integration 
which allows the, uh, the teachers uh, to create shared workspaces on the platform and then uh, assign uh, uh, teachers and students automatically to those shared workspaces. And any content they, they put on the shared workspaces becomes directly available uh, to, to all the users. Um, I mean, the students and, and the instructors of, of those courses. So uh, this helps them to, uh, to uh, either uh, do the exercises and also sometimes uh, follow the workflows that are uh, necessary for, for, for the course. Um, Jupyter Lab in, in general is uh, very heavily used for uh, many different purposes. So uh, the Lingo experiment, for example, uh, which was announced uh, about two years ago, uh, announced the results by using the Jupyter notebooks. So uh, they are available. Um, yeah, but that has nothing to do with our education, as far as I can tell. But I think what you talk about with the with the Canvas integration, I think that's really something neat that would be interesting to to see for us how how that uh, works out and how how people actually can make education uh, better. Um, by using uh, Jupyter Notebooks in, in education. I think that would have been really something interesting for me to see. Um, I can do that, but for that we need to uh, we need to have another another meeting because in that case I can prepare the examples for you and uh, we, we can have a look uh, how people are, are using in fact the Jupyter Lab. Um, but as I announced in the content uh, of the training uh, about three, three weeks ago, this training is more about how to use Jupyter Lab. Uh, and partly, yes, it is like tutorials available on YouTube or Internet because they are not different. So yep. this is my, my 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 intention was to show how it works. In fact, okay. because we have we have many new 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 people who who, who are new to interactive notebooks and Jupyter Lab in, in general. So I think uh, this can be useful uh, for them uh, to learn, first of all, uh, the logic behind uh, how, how it works, how it is connected to, to others. But I completely agree. The examples, of course, are, are really necessary uh, to see how it is used in real life cases. Um, yeah, we can we can arrange another meeting for that purpose. You could even you could even argue that the examples are needed in the first place to uh, stimulate that people understand what it is about. Because uh, as as it was presented now, I think a lot of people who don't have a programming background had a really really hard time to follow uh, and, and understand how it could be useful for them in the future. So I think the, the examples would be good to have on the front end so mm -hmm. people understand what it is about. Yes. OK, we can arrange something like this. But what I can tell you eventually, because the, the idea behind the notebooks is in fact to combine code, first of all, with other supportive material like narratives and outputs, uh, you need to do some programming. So this is a tool not for non-programmers. So of course they can use existing notebooks. Uh, they can understand uh, the logic behind because there is already a narrative, so they can read. They can, it's it's like a, a article. So you can read the article. You can uh, learn the background, and you can you can also uh, follow uh, the workflow that is defined in the article to understand how the computations are done, right? And then afterwards maybe you can apply if you have tools available for that purpose. So uh, this is not different in case of, of uh, notebooks. So one can read the notebooks, they can understand, and they can also uh, use the notebooks by changing some parameters. Um, um, but this is a very basic use case, to, to be honest. So in order to get the best performance and, and uh, to, to create something by using the notebooks, um, a, a certain level of programming is, is necessary. Um, that's why, actually, um, well, um, the, 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 I can give this uh, maybe uh, similarity. So uh, we have word processors, right? Uh, and with the word processor, you can write a novel in Dutch, or you can write a very short notice in, in English, right? Or even you can create just a simple table also by using a word processor. So um, the, the, the idea of this training is not to teach how to write a novel or how to how to write in Dutch. So these are the things that you need to learn in in in, in, in another context. So uh, you need to follow a Dutch course to learn how to write in Dutch. And this is partly similar. So if you want to if you want to use the notebooks uh, to do the computation, for example, by using Python, 
of course you need to be a competent um, person in Python and you should follow uh, needed courses for that purpose. And there are in fact some initiatives also. So first of all, there are many tutorials and there are many online courses that are available, but there are also initiatives like uh, the Digital Competence Center of UT, uh, which is uh, the software carpenters and they teach uh, actually the basics of Python, the basics of um, uh, Linux shell, the basics of R. Um, and uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, similar interfaces can in fact facilitate to learn this because you can you can try very easily uh, the to programming without installing uh, software packages or you can use um, the, the narrative part of, of the notebooks uh, to first understand what they are and then try them also on the same side, which is quite effective. Um, yeah, but definitely the next the next uh, meeting let's organize in that way. So uh, the idea uh, in that time uh, uh, will be to show examples uh, from uh, geospatial and Earth observation domain how people are using uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, to to do the computation and also the education. So that's also something very important. So there are many examples actually for that purpose. Even I mentioned uh, the MB grader extension. So uh, so uh, people are using uh, Jupyter notebooks to grade students. To, to give the assignments to the students and then collect them and then do the grading automatically. So we, we are at that level actually with, that, with this technology. Uh, how it can be implemented at ITC? It is something we, we need to discuss, but uh, I think we should discuss together so we, we can provide support for, for technical uh, topics, but uh, eventually I think uh, you should be also part of this discussion uh, to tell us what is needed. Yes, I see another hand. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Gurdon, uh, for the presentation. My name is Anurag and I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the EOS department. Uh, my my question is that, that I work with the radar data sets, which are quite bulky, uh, uh, quite uh, large in size. Uh, so my question is how much hard disk space is allocated for uh, each uh, machine, uh, each virtual machine, which will be, uh, which I will use uh, when I use the IDC geospatial computing facility? Uh, well, we don't have any limit in the storage uh, for, for the geospatial computing platform. So we have right now uh, 200 terabytes of storage that is available and whenever necessary, we can add more. Uh, but this is a question regarding the platform. So uh, I will be happy to answer such questions. Just contact me uh, at the end of the training and I can provide you more detailed information. Yeah, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, any questions about uh, J Jupiter Lab? Uh, okay, then let me continue just a, li a little bit more. So uh, yeah, this will be a basic basic uh, t tutorial, but uh, eventually it's really basic because uh, when you when you show how a word processor works, it is also basic. So you you show how how to change the font, how to change the color, so that uh, people at the end can write a novel. So uh, uh, please consider this as such. Uh, so uh, I will just show basically how the interface uh, works. Um, I, I won't go into the details of programming and I just show the, the Python examples just to run some example code actually, uh, nothing else. Um, and the interface, as I mentioned, uh, can, can be arranged very easily. So you can put uh, um, uh, notebooks side by side. You can also uh, op open uh, the different different files uh, like, like CSV files. Uh, some of the extensions allows you to edit them, in fact. So it is not just uh, um, a visualization, but it, it, they can be also edited. And if you if you edit them and if you save them here, as you can see, they are reflected automatically because uh, the, the editors and the viewers which are connected to the same file are kept synchronized. So if you save something, then the other one reflects. And this is also the same uh, for, uh, for, for, for the code notebooks. So if you run a code and if it creates an output and if that output is connected to another uh, console, uh, then the output is also automatically updated. Um, uh, 
uh, each each um, notebook uh, or uh, console that you have uh, is listed under uh, the running uh, tab on the left hand side. As here you can see the open tabs and if you want you can close some of the tabs directly from here and you can also see the kernels that are running. So uh, by shutting down a kernel, in fact, you, you, you can terminate the, the computation and this will also terminate the notebook that is connected or, or the console that is connected uh, to, uh, to, to the kernel. Um, as I mentioned, okay, closing uh, just the, 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 the notebooks uh, doesn't shut down the kernels. They still continue to run here. And in fact, if you double click, then you will have access uh, to, to, to the same uh, notebook that is connected to, to the uh, computing kernel. If it is doing a computation, you will, you will reach a point where the computation is currently uh, doing. So uh, you, you, it doesn't pause the computation, it just lets it uh, running. Um, and this is really nice if you need to run uh, long uh, duration computations. Uh, there are terminals, so from the launcher it is also possible to open a terminal. So the terminal is depends on, on the operating system that you use. So if your machine is Windows, then you will have access to PowerShell. Uh, if the machine works, then in that case you, you have access to, uh, to, to the default shell of, 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 of the uh, remote server. In this case we have Ubuntu and we have Bash shell running, but here you can, you can use text mode applications um, as you use uh, by using a normal uh, des desktop um, a connection uh, to, uh, to to that machine. Uh, it, your mouse is also running, so if, if if the text mode application uses mouse, it is also um, accepted uh, by the by the terminal. Uh, it is possible to copy paste a content from from the terminal you just mark it and then uh, basically uh, if you use the, the, the default copy paste uh, in, in this case uh, I use control C and then it is it is a uh, copied and you can paste it to 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 the, your host machine by uh, by control V by simple uh, pasting. Um, uh, the settings uh, can be changed uh, by, by, by using the settings menu. As I mentioned, there are different teams. Uh, uh, you, you can switch to a dark team or you can switch to a light team. Right now we are using a light one. It's very easy to change it dark and uh, it, it changed directly. But it is also uh, possible uh, to, to, to change um, uh, the text editor teams. So if you, if you have, for example, a Python code and if you open it in a text editor, so let me open this with a uh, text editor. Right, it opens in, in JSON, but um, um, uh, if you have a code and if you open it with, uh, let me open this. With editor, you can also change the the highlighting based on different themes. So here you will see how the colors are 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 changing. Uh, we have this advanced settings editor, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation. So let me switch to to light. Uh, there are um, many options that you can customize, and customization is really very easy. And most of them are also uh, automatic. So uh, they reflect uh, directly. So if, for example, in the file blo browser. Here we say, see the show last modified column is true. So this is why this last modified column is displayed. If we copy, copy this and if we update the user preference here to false and save it, then you see that column disappears. So uh, this is how you uh, change uh, the, the settings. And the settings are in fact uh, permanent. So next time you, you open JupyterLab, uh, you will see it in the same uh, setting. Um, and uh, the system also keeps the workspace. So uh, here I have several files that are open, uh, including the last settings one. So if I close uh, the web browser and I just leave it, and then if I connect again uh, to, to, the, to the platform, 
then the system will automatically open the default workspace and will show me uh, the, the, the windows as, as, as they were. Uh, so uh, this is also a very nice feature. So uh, let's say uh, the ITC building is closing around seven, uh, but your computation is not finished. So all you need to do is just uh, close the web browser without uh, choosing the log off. And then you can cycle back to your home um, and then you can continue uh, to, to work from home with the same workspace. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is also possible to save the workspaces. So uh, you, you can save the workspace um, and share it with your other colleagues so that you, they can have the same uh, shared workspace. Um, one thing um, we can use uh, is to export uh, the, the notebooks. Uh, here I just want to show you how these reveal uh, slides are working. So basically you can you can use different different formats. Uh, you can you can export this in, 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 in LaTeX and then edit it in, in your uh, favorite LaTeX editor or online by, uh, by using Overleaf. Um, but if you export the slides and then open it, uh, you will see uh, all 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 um, the formatting that you have. I'm doing this way. Uh, reflected uh, to 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 the presentation, and then you have also uh, the slides. So you you can go back back and forth uh, between the slides, and by changing by changing uh, the, the metadata of, of a column, it is possible to 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 change also the presentation. So in this case, you you use the right sidebar. Uh, here, the first item is is the properties. So uh, here you can set set the type as if, for example, slide, um, and then this one, this cell will become a, a independent slide. Uh, and if you save it, export it again. In, the, in this case, sorry, let me say in this way. I will skip this second one, second option. Export. As you can see, the second second cell is this disappeared because uh, I set it in the metadata. So uh, this is how you basically uh, customize the cells and uh, export the results uh, in, in, in different formats. Um, on a geospatial computing platform, we don't have PDF uh, functionality that is uh, that is unfortunately disabled because uh, PDF export uh, does not work uh, properly. Um, but on your own machine, it might be possible to install necessary um, packages and then uh, export uh, the notebooks uh, as, as PDF files. Uh, you can you can download a, a file just by uh, right clicking and selecting the download option. Uh, it is possible to uh, to select multiple files and download them at once. But uh, in order to download a, a folder, uh, you you need to uh, you need to use an extension. In this case, we have uh, the archive extension that is uh, available on the platform, and this allows us to to download a, a folder by using a a zip or a tar uh, archive. So if you just click the zip, the folder is automatically uh, compressed and uh, you can download the zip file. And on the contrary, you can also upload a zip file uh, to, to, to the platform and extract it there uh, to, to transfer the files easily. In that case, here we have the upload uh, icon and uh, by clicking it, you can select the file uh, as if you upload a normal file uh, to, to, to the platform. These are some examples um, of, of, of the interface. So um, uh, if you have any questions, I, I will be happy to answer.
Uh, anybody who wants to comment about uh, his or her use of uh, JupyterLab? It can be for, uh, for, for the thesis studies or it can be for, for courses, which can uh, provide some insight about the use case with ITC or also maybe outside. Yes, Petra. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Hello. Hi, Zerkan. I'm Mam Suhaib um, from the Water Resources. Actually, Roloff uh, also with us. Um, initiated in the summer school of URSU with the first uh, session to use Jupyter uh, Notebook. Um, on binder, uh, it caused a little bit of problem, but at the end it was solved. Uh, and there we we um, we were able to uh, to do some exercises on climate extremes. And what you have just mentioned is really nice because um, yeah, the student they don't need to. Um, do you hear me? Yes. So the student, they don't need to really have a previous programming language, but, uh, and this is uh, a question to you, um, because of that, they did not really um, dive deep into the uh, concepts of, or the logics behind these uh, code lines, and they just run it, and if it gives them results, then it's okay. So for somebody that is not interested in programming, it is, uh, this is my first impression because this is the first uh, time that I tried it with a student. Um, for somebody that has no programming experience is fine. But for somebody um, uh, who wants to learn this, uh, it might be a little bit um, not really aging in that yeah. uh, in that sense um, um yeah are a little bit not interested we stay not uninterested and the one that are interested they could pick up very fast this is what where i want to uh, can you can you give us some thought what do you think yes well um yeah, using interactive notebooks for, uh, for for research or, or for for education or for capacity de development, it it of course requires a partly a cultural change, the way the way we we, we work, uh, because eventually um, we are moving our computation from desktop machines uh, to to the cloud. So normally in the, the typical uh, I, I I guess or, or at least in in the past, uh, each student had a had a machine. A, a, in a computer lab, right, where we have uh, all the required uh, software that is installed, and the files are copied to those machines or available to a local local server machine, and uh, all the computation was done on on that machines physically. So uh, when we move to the cloud, um, uh, our our view should partly change, and uh, this is more so when we use interactive notebooks because eventually. Uh, we are doing computation, uh, similar computation, which sometimes can be done also by using soft, uh, desktop applications, by using, for example, by using QGIS, or sometimes even by using Excel, right? So even you can use Excel for, for doing some basic computation, even some basic modeling. So um, this is really um, a different way of, of work, working, and, and there should be a motivation. And I see it quite common, uh, uh, similar uh, to what we had actually during the COVID era, because online education was also something uh, not even heard by some of us, or something that was quite new, let's say, and probably quite challenging. But in one week, we switched uh, to online education, right? So uh, if there is a motivation, I think people can easily handle this kind of things. So eventually, um, the programming, I believe, is something um, most of the students uh, somehow have in their background. Uh, basic basic programming. So it doesn't need to be 
R, it doesn't need to be Python, but I believe in, 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 in the bachelor, in most of the universities, if it is especially a technical university, that, that, that is already provi provided. Um, and and, and um, I think it is also um, a part of our curriculum. So because at ITC, we have many courses which in fact teach this kind of uh, pro programming languages. They use R, they use Python, they use SQL uh, to, to do the computations necessary. Uh, here we are moving to, to another uh, type of tool set. Um, uh, and as long as we have a motivation to do that, I think uh, it will be successful. And the motivation could be, in fact, the cultural change globally, because that is becoming something quite mainstream. So we are talking a lot about open science, uh, sharing sharing um, the, the, the research, and the, the, the easiest, the most common way to do that is, in fact, to, 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 to create your, your workflows by using this kind of interactive notebooks and share them with others. Yeah, thank you. I really like uh, this uh, mindset uh, <laughs> yeah. change. W one last question from my side, um, and this is related to what you have just mentioned. Uh, you have mentioned a little bit QGIS and, and other um, uh, um, how we say it, external tools. Uh, and here I would like to ask about your support in Crib. Uh, if uh, somebody um, would like to use a tool uh, that uh, provides some uh, specified functionality um, on top on the normal um, library of Python, for instance, um, would you be willing to, or is there a room, let me put it that way, uh, to have such a, a support? Uh, yes, there is. So uh, ev eventually um, we are here with all our uh, expertise, uh, so which might be sometimes limited, but in that case we have also other uh, services that are available. So for example, we have coding support, uh, which mainly um, aims to have a pool of uh, a, a somehow experienced computer science background uh, in this case, students, uh, student assistants to help actually our staff members to, to have better programming uh, practices, including, for example, uh, moving existing workflows to, uh, to, to, to a different language. So if you, if, you, if you do a computation by using QJS and uh, you know what to do, um, we, we can help you to convert it into, into an interactive notebook or uh, uh, to, to restructure the workflow. Yeah, sorry for interrupt. My, my really question is, if I have a large group and suppose we are running, uh, and this is what we are going to do, we are going to run a MOOC, um, mm -hmm. which we use also Jupyter Notebook, uh, and, and this MOOC, you, might, you, you know, we might get 1,000 uh, participants, uh, yes. at least in the first few days, <laughs> yes. maybe 3,000, and this is our key performance indicator to have 3,500 participants. In, in a crib, can we have, uh, can, are we able to support that number accessing, um, maybe not at the same time, because this would be impossible, but at least you will have a few hundred of students accessing the same um, ecosystem at the same time. Can we support this? Um, multiple uh, access um. yeah well 3000 is a very uh, demanding number to be honest it's not so easy to uh, to serve uh, 3000 people uh, of course they will not connect at the same time but still i think uh, but there are some options available so for example i showed jupyter light so jupyter light because it's running completely on the web browser and it is running on the web browser of, of the user so in that case uh, these 3000 people in fact can use jupyter light very easily because there is no infrastructure pressure with that system, so uh, we we can we can discuss these kind of solutions, and we can definitely help you to find these kind of solutions. Thank you very much, Serkan. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And in fact, it's great if you if you show three thousand people how to use Jupyter Lab. Actually, you are changing the culture. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's a fact. Actually, yes, this is the idea. Thanks to uh, Rolof, uh, he uh, pushed us uh, in that direction. Yes. And the, the, the MOOC, it should run in the coming uh, few uh, months. Uh, but I don't know how many participants we will have. But I will continue this discussion uh, with you, uh, Rolof, uh, aside, mm -hmm. just to give uh, room for other participants to ask questions. 
because this is a little bit more specific to a certain mm -hmm. case. But thank you very much for your presentation. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you for your us. comment. Um, Petra was asking a question. Sorry, Petra. Um, if you are still there. You are muted. Sorry, you are muted. I'm still still here. I was just uh, totally different to them from uh, to, uh, uh, in your code. You have A is something and then uh, A is world and then later on you have uh, A is 10 or something. Uh, what is A? Is it redefined all the time? Yes, well, it is a variable. In Python, you can re redefine the variables at any time. Okay, and so the type is also uh, the last one. It yes, it is dynamic. So yeah. it, it, the type, the types are dynamic in Python. So depending on the assignment, it automatically changes. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, for those people who are interested in Python, actually, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Digital Competence Center will organize a Python uh, software carpentry uh, quite soon. And, and uh, for people who know Python programming, uh, they are looking also for helper, helpers uh, who can help others uh, by just showing uh, simple things. So uh, if, you are, if you are interested, please take contact to DCC. Uh, they will be very, uh, very happy to have your support. But if you want to learn, also please follow this is the announcement, so it can be really, really useful. Uh, Seka, I have another question. It's similar to Chris. Is there anything uh, on geospatial packages or something that we can use? Because I, I don't see people going to code in Python all the arrays to read uh, files and write files and. Yes, of course. So we have a wide selection of packages that are available on the platform. So uh, basically we have a complete list. Uh, uh, if you go to the public folder and then platform, we have uh, here the Python packages. Uh, and, and if you open it, okay. you, you can see the list. And basically if you just do a search uh, with GIS yeah. or I don't know, raster, uh, shape, yeah, know. Yeah. you can find. So yeah, that, that thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, under the resources also, we have this Python data science handbook. So uh, if, if, you, if you are willing to learn uh, more about uh, interactive notebooks and how to use Python uh, with interactive notebooks, you can just follow this handbook. Uh, it is written as notebooks. So uh, basically, and, and actually it's a very nice example uh, which shows uh, how uh, interactive notebooks can be used for, for education purposes. So basically it tells all, all the details uh, about um, about Jupyter and notebooks, but it also provides you a, a lot of information about how to use uh, some data science packages like, for example, Pandas. And here the examples are all interactive. Uh, and because we have the packages that are installed on the platform, uh, you, you can run them and you can run and you can see the results directly. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, by changing by changing uh, the code, uh, you, you can also see the results. So here, for example, we run the, the code and the numbers are indicated here as such. So if we change the number, then the result changes. So um, yeah, this is very basic, but eventually uh, you, you can create very advanced examples also. Um, any other uh, questions or, or comments? Uh, Jason just shared the link. And uh, this is European Space Agency and uh, I think they have an open EO cloud which allows you to, to access the JupyterLab interface uh, for, for Earth observation. Yes, it's this one. It's this one, I think, Jason, right?
so basically, yeah, there are there are different organizations which provide uh, resources for that purpose. Uh, in fact, at ITC we are we are leading a EO Africa R&D project uh, of ESA, and uh, we will develop a innovation lab which is based on uh, Jupiter uh, technology to to support research projects uh, for three years. Okay. Um, Thank you very much uh, for, for your participation. Uh, I hope uh, it was useful. Um, um, most of the training was in fact uh, to provide some information about, about uh, Jupiter Lab and uh, uh, the capabilities that it has. Um, the hands-on part was partly a little bit uh, small um, because once you have the information and once you install also Jupyter Lab, you, you can really easily uh, try it. Um, my intention was to provide you a little bit more information about how 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 to do that uh, instead of uh, showing how how to uh, how to perform the task itself. Uh, the documentation of Jupyter Lab is really quite extensive, so uh, you can find also more information if you just uh, have a look at the uh, Jupyter uh, documentation. Uh, the nice thing is they have also videos available. So, and most of the documentation is in fact uh, composed of uh, YouTube videos, uh, which shows uh, how to perform several tasks. Um, they are very short videos, uh, several seconds, usually 10, 15 seconds. So, uh, by just uh, watching the videos, also you can understand uh, better uh, how to how to use the interface. Okay, uh, thanks again. I stop recording now.